Good morning everybody, welcome to Burniston Methodist Church. Um, just a reminder in the notices about the picnic today at one o'clock. Looking forward to seeing you all. Um, bring your own food and drink and a chair and a blanket, um, maybe an umbrella too, looking at the, way, the weather. And don't forget, don't forget your PPE, don't forget your mask. Um, directions regarding um, seating um, will, on site will be given when, when you get there. Okay, so look forward to seeing you all. So now then, I've been away on holiday with Ian. We've both been away visiting our lovely family. And let me show you, here she is. Our granddaughter, Imogen. She's lovely, isn't she? Yeah. So we've had a really lovely time. And um, but we, yesterday when um, we got back the other day, um, but yesterday we spent um, catching up with some of the, um, the services that we'd missed over the last few weeks, and um, just to have like a bulk of services to watch back to back was such a blessing, really is. And um, I just want to give out a massive, massive thank you to all of those people. That are involved in blessing us every week. Big shout out goes to the people giving the warm friendly welcomes, those giving the clear scripture readings, brilliant and oh, amazing, the creative contributions from our amazing children and I've said amazing twice and it's because it's, they are amazing and the parents, don't forget the parents because they are very involved in too. Thank you for those. And for the preachers, thank you for the challenging and encouraging sermons that's um, given us so much to think about and put into practice. So thank you for that. And for all those people that um, do the prayers, heartfelt prayers, and not forgetting the hardworking technical team. I think it's probably one. Ross and uh, who ensure that our service is um, compiled seamlessly and is on air on time every week so massive thank you to all of you god bless you all your uplifting contributions are appreciated by so many thank you thank you thank you the love of jesus really does shine through this screen so you're you're brilliant all of you and the Lord is absolutely wonderful. And I, for one, I really miss singing with you all together, singing his praises. And um, just today, let's really give thanks. We're so thankful to him for letting us know how to live the best life, not on our own, but with each other and with his Holy Spirit living inside us to help us become more like Jesus. And I'm going to re read some of the lyrics of the song, which is at the end of the service today. And um, I'm going to use it like a prayer to focus on God's assurance of his great love for us and his promises for all of us. So here are the lyrics. So you want to just um, listen and use it as a prayer these are the lyrics Jesus said that if I thirst I should come to him no one else can satisfy I should come to him Jesus said if I am weak I should come to him no one else can be my strength I should come to him for the Lord is good and faithful. He will <clears throat> keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus. Jesus, strong and kind. Jesus said that if I fear I should come to, to him, no one else can be my shield. I should come to him. Jesus said, if I am lost, he will come to me. And he showed me on that cross, 
he will come to me. For the Lord is good and faithful. He will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus. Jesus, strong and kind. <clears throat> Amen. So another thing I want to say today is um, that it's a bit tinged with a bit of sadness. Because um, it's, it's David's um, last official sermon today. We're so thankful to you, David, for all the positive energy, the love, the care, the sensitivity and wisdom that you have injected into our church family. Your creative presentation has inspired all of us to look more closely and observe the world, its people and its places where God has put us. We know that he will continue to bless others through your ministry, David. Thank you. And as Jesus continues to teach us more about what it means to be one of his followers, you have helped us to listen more clearly and notice the details of the sights along the journey together, giving us a boost of encouragement when we're a bit weary. We know that our paths will cross and we look forward to those meeting places where we can stop a while and have a chat. We pray for you and Sue to receive a blessing of peace as you discover new adventures with Jesus along the way. So thank you, David, and um, we'll see you at the picnic. And we'll see all of our church family at the picnic, those that can make it. And we'll be remembering those that are unable to get there. And um, yeah, see you then. Don't forget your masks. Ooh. God bless you. See ya. Good morning, everyone. The reading today is taken from Hebrews, partly from chapters 1, chapter 2, and from chapter 3. Long ago, at different times and in various ways, God's voice came to our ancestors through the Hebrew prophets. But in these last days, it has come to us through his Son, the one who has been given dominion over all things and through whom all worlds were made. This is the one who imprinted with God's image, shimmering with his glory, sustains all that exists through the power of his word. We ought to pay even closer attention to the voice that has been speaking so that we will never drift away from it. God also testifies to this truth by signs and wonders and miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit lighting on those he chooses. So all of you who are holy partners in a heavenly calling, let's turn our attention to Jesus, the emissary of God and high priest, who brought us the faith we profess. For we have become partners with the anointed one, if we can just hold on to our confidence until the end. So, instead of your thoughts looking like a cloud or a bubble, imagine if they looked like this, a wheel. Now, anybody who knows the Williams family will know that we like to go for a bike ride. Some of us like it a bit more than others, but that's what jelly babies are for. Let's have a closer look at the wheel. It's made up of the hub in the middle and then there are the spokes which connect the hub to the rim and the tyre. So the wheel has a fixed point around which it rotates. Now the Bible tells us to fix our thoughts on Jesus so let's call the hub Jesus. The spokes are what connects us to the hub 
to Jesus. So we've got some labels for the spokes, Rosie, and they're on the floor. Do you want to get them? Okay, what's that first one? Bible study. Bible study. So that speaks for itself. Know what that is? Prayer. Prayer, talking to Jesus. Fellowship. Fellowship. There might be something inside there, Rosie. <clears throat> Meeting together or talking with people who love Jesus too. Okay, that helps us stay connected to Jesus. Anything else? Meditation. And there might be something inside that one. Focusing on our thoughts on Jesus using a verse of scripture, words or a picture. Okay. So we can deliberately focus our thoughts on Jesus through meditation, can't we? Can that one go on one of the spokes? A bit tricky. That'll do. Holy Spirit. There's something inside that one too. We can ask the Holy Spirit to take over, guide our thoughts and keep them centred on Jesus. Okay, so we've got a bit of help. <laughs> that one doesn't want to stay, does it? Worship. Brilliant, thank you very much. Okay, so now imagine that the hub of the wheel is not in the centre, but over here somewhere near the edge. Can you imagine what it might be like trying to ride along the cinder track? I doubt if you get very far up um, Limestone Road, Rosie, yeah, that's what it would look like. <laughs> the hub needs to be in the middle and the spokes need to be strong. And who's in charge of the spokes? Well, you are. It's our choice to put Jesus at the centre of our thoughts and our habits that will keep him there. Now get your pens ready for a really exciting craft. Hello everyone, it's David here with my last talk as Minister in Pastoral Charge of Burniston and Filingthorpe Churches. So let me start by saying what a delight and a privilege it has been to be your Minister over these last two years. It was a complete surprise to be asked, a real gift and a treat from God, uh, and you've been such a blessing to me. So thank you for all that we've shared together. It's our practice when we move or leave an appointment to stay away for a year, to give our successor free reign and free from the ghost of their predecessor. So I'll need to stay away from a little while 
but hopefully we'll be able to return to worship at Burniston sometime next year. So I look forward to seeing you again. So what am I doing sitting here on the cliff top? Well, I've chosen some extracts from Hebrews. Never preached on them before, but when I looked at them, it seemed to me that they were just perfect for this final reflection with you because they help us to understand how we are spirit-led with a heart for Jesus and a passion for mission. And as you see, as we unpack the readings together, they are full of so many really excellent insights into our faith journey, especially as today the sun is trying to break through the mist which shrouds the landscape and this text shows us how God's light in Jesus breaks through the mist that shrouds us and keeps us from seeing our way. And how Jesus is the pure radiance of God's love for us. We're going to find a lot about vision. We're going to find a lot about purpose. We're going to find a lot about presence. And so here on the clifftop, as the mist burns off, I invite you to join me on a walk in the sunshine with God. Before GPS, in the 1930s, this trig point was an essential part of mapping the British Isles. Its location was precisely known, its height above sea level exactly determined. And using thousands of these, it was possible very, very accurately to map the landscape of these islands and to produce those maps which would be used by hundreds and thousands of people ever since to explore our country. All because of these trig points. And as I reflect on two years of circuit ministry here in the wonderful North Yorkshire Coast Circuit, it seems to me that the extract from Hebrews that I've chosen offers just such a trig point as this one. Something solid and tangible, something important that helps us know where we are in the journey of faith, helps to keep us safe, helps to keep us on track, going in the right direction, knowing where we're headed, knowing where we've been, knowing precisely at any one time where we are with God and where we need to be. These extracts and the themes within them are absolutely key and essential, just like this trig point that I'm leaning up against in the sunshine. So let's explore these themes together, shall we? And map out the territory that God wants us to explore. Hebrews begins in a really thrilling way with the most majestic vision of what faith is about you could ever imagine. It's just so expansive, it's like sitting up here on the cliff top where you can just see for miles and miles and miles and it's as though you're going to miss nothing at all, it's all there laid out in front of you. So too with Hebrews because the writer begins with the most wonderful declaration that God has dominion and authority and responsibility over everything, which means that the subject of our faith is everything that God has created. And the writer goes on to affirm that in Jesus, God has created everything, has dominion over everything, and turns our eyes to that truth and uses that truth as the lens through which we view the whole landscape, potential and possibility of our faith. It's an exhilarating place to begin because it frames everything for us, opens our eyes, helps us to 
be open-minded and open-hearted in our response to Jesus and to how we express our faith. It's a good, wonderful place to begin. So now we move on to the next reference point of faith, and this is all to do with Jesus and with us having a heart for Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews gives us three really distinctive ways in which we can emulate Jesus as he describes what Jesus is like. And the first of these reference points is this, that Jesus is imprinted with God's image. Now this sculpture is one I was given when I left my last circuit. It was a thank you gift from a colleague of mine. We'd been out for a local preacher's meeting at a local farm. We met out of doors. A local sculptor used the area that we were meeting in for his workshop and outside he'd got some unfinished pieces and this was one of them. It was tucked on the floor out of the way and it just took my attention and I couldn't keep my eyes off it. Because it, for me it was just so theologically potent, really powerful about being made in the image of God and through our imperfection, through the very nature of our being, God's image was beginning to be revealed and shown and I really loved it and I asked if I could photograph it and I did and I thought nothing more of it until the colleague gave it to me as a leaving gift because they knew how much I liked it. So here it is for you to see and I share it with you. As we look at the different angles of the sculpture, you can see it is unfinished. And that's part of its beauty, because we're unfinished. God's image is still being perfected in us. And the image of Jesus at the heart of our being is desperate to be more fully revealed. And so for the writer to Hebrews, being imprinted with God's image is really important and it matters above all other things. If we're to emulate Jesus, we should strive to let his image become more and more visible in ours. And the writer then goes on to this second reference point about how we can be those people who have a heart for Jesus when the writer says, and Jesus was shimmering with God's glory. Now here's a photograph I took looking towards Filey from the top of the cliff at Speeton when I was recording the video. And if you look at the sea and the sand and the landscape, it's shimmering, shimmering in the beauty of the light, shimmering and coming alive. And that's the sense that the writer of Hebrews has got about Jesus shimmering with God's glory. And that's what we are to emulate too. We should be shimmering with God's glory, alive with the glory, radiant and visible. Not only imprinted with God's image, but shimmering with God's glory as a visible reminder of God's loving presence and purpose in our midst. And the final point of reference that the writer comes up with is that, yes, Jesus is imprinted with God's image. Yes, he's shimmering with God's glory. And the purpose of all of this is that he sustains all that exists through the power of his word. And so the purpose we have as those with a heart for Jesus is to sustain God's creation. Just think about that for a moment. To be imprinted with God's image, to be shimmering with God's glory, isn't enough of itself. It's the very purpose that matters, and that is to sustain everything God loves. And of course, we see that in Jesus. Now, the image I'm using is a sculpture of Atlas bearing the weight of the world on his shoulders. And it's at Port Merion in North Wales. And just look at it, that, that sense of struggle. 
that sense of commitment, that sense of burden. That's what Jesus invites us to participate in as his disciples, to take the world's need and to make it our own and to carry it with him. So the writer to Hebrews gives us these three incredibly important reference points and they're all rooted in Jesus and they encourage us to have a real heart for Jesus ourselves. And now we come to another wonderful reference point that the writer of Hebrews gives to us. In the text, the writer says that we should pay even closer attention to the voice that has been speaking so that we will never drift away from it. And that's an encouragement to draw close to the Holy Spirit, to be aware of the Spirit's promptings, to take heed of it and to act upon it. So let's look at some images which bring this alive to us. And the first image we're, we're going to look at is this one. This is an image of comedy and tragedy. It's on the wall of a house opposite Caister Methodist Church in North Lincolnshire. And it's really striking. You have the happy, jolly comedy and the really sad and soulful and miserable tragedy. But of course there is a third figure here and it's the shadow. The shadow that is cast by these figures. And the Holy Spirit is engaged in all of our lives, in the totality of our being, in the joys, in the delights, and yes, in the tragedy and in the sorrow and in the heartbreak, and also in the shadows that we cast upon the lives of one another. The Holy Spirit is there prompting us at the heart of our relationships to be mindful of who we're called to be in Jesus and calling us to pay close attention to what Jesus has to say to us about the whole of our life, not just the good bits, not just the sad parts, but also the shadow side of who we are, that really difficult and desperate part of our nature that we would rather avoid. Which brings me to this image, which I took not far from where we live, just by the side of the footpath to Hunmanby, there is this huge pile of manure. And it's just as well you can't smell it, because smell it does. It really is quite revolting. And yet, if this is used as fertiliser, it can make the crops really grow. And of course, what the Holy Spirit is asking us to pay attention to is those aspects of our life and our community and our common purpose, which need to be transformed to take all that is wrong, all that we regret, and allow God to transform it into something that will bless and be positive. And so the writer to Hebrews is mindful of all of this when he says, pay closer attention to the voice that has been speaking. And of course, God speaks to us in those places within our experience, our memory and our being, that we would rather not be mindful of those really difficult parts of who we are, the way we get things wrong, all the guilt and regret. God wants to take it and transform it and use it to bless others. And so if we pay closer attention to what God is saying and never drift away from it, we will have real trust. And this image is about trust. It's a young girl abseiling off one of the great viaducts in the Peak District. And she is dependent on the skill of the instructors, but she is depending on the strength of the rope above all and the kit she's wearing. Neither the instructor nor the rope can afford to fail and she trusts her whole life to it as she kicks off from the parapet of the viaduct and abseils right down to the bottom of the valley for the very first time. 
And God wants us to trust him. God wants us to trust in Jesus. God wants us to be spirit led in all things and kick off and go with God where God leads us because Jesus will not fail us and the spirit will not let us down. And so there is nothing we can't face. And if we pay close attention to the voice that is speaking, if we never drift away from the Spirit's prompting, we will be like the poppies in this image. The poppies are the great opportunists. They grow in disturbed ground. They take every opportunity they can to flourish and to blossom. The great opportunist speaks of the Holy Spirit, God's wonderful opportunistic presence. And it's the Spirit who leads us to exploit the opportunities for mission and ministry and discipleship that are all around us in life, in the church, beyond it, in our communities, in the world. And the Spirit prompts us to be like poppies and to flourish and to grow there and to be visible and to be a real blessing. So the writer to the Hebrews in these reference points helps us to be spirit-led. If you look at this majestic tree, you can see that it's shaped by the wind. It's the only one, it's all by itself up here on the cliff top, and it's unmistakable with that profile you know it's subject to really powerful forces, the force of the wind let loose up here. And the tree has adapted and been shaped by that dominant power. And that's what the writer to the Hebrews has in mind, I think, when they write of the church and our faith being shaped by signs and wonders and miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Clearly, for this writer, that's normal. It's to be expected when you look at someone of faith or a gathering of Christians in the name of Jesus, then you would expect to see signs, wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't, it would be like just looking at a normal tree of normal shape. But to look at the church that Jesus founded in the power of the Spirit is, to this writer, to see something really different, distinctive, stand out. Like that tree, the expectation is that we will be shaped by the Holy Spirit so that there will be in our midst, amongst us and within us and throughout us and beyond us, signs and wonders and miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit will be real and tangible and known and felt. So how do we get to that place? Well, like the tree, we put ourselves in God's way. We allow ourselves to feel the full presence of God's Spirit. We can do it through prayer. We can do it through staying close to Scripture. We can do it through mission. We can do it through our passion for Jesus. We can do it by searching and searching for God's plan, for what God wants to do in our churches and through us, and doing that together. But of course, the way we really get shaped, like that tree, is to be spirit-led, with a heart for Jesus and a passion for mission. In my ministry for churches, I've seen that are shaped like this tree are precisely those that are spirit-led with a heart for Jesus and a passion for mission. That's what the writer to the Hebrews expects to see. It's not unusual, out of the ordinary. It's just how it is when that's what we practice. Spirit-led, heart for Jesus and a passion for mission. Now that's spectacular, isn't it? So the writer to the Hebrews ends the extract that I've chosen 
by saying something that is absolutely vital for us to understand. It's that we are holy partners with God. Just think about that for a moment. We are holy partners in God's creation. We are called to be co-creators in creation, to work in partnership with God, to renew, to transform everything that is, to birth hope, to bring freedom and justice and peace, to remake the common good as a benefit for everyone, and to work to save the planet, our home. In all of that, we are called to be holy partners with God, which is the most wonderful vocation imaginable. What more could we wish for than to be holy partners with the creator of everything that is? God calls us to this task and doesn't leave us alone, but expects that because it's God who's calling, we will have confidence. And so the writer to Hebrews says, of Hebrews says, that we should have confidence. Confidence in God, confidence in the task ahead of us. And we should, because God is real. God is as real as this bale of straw. God is as real as this hay in my fingers, as substantial as this which is taking my weight as I sit against it. The harvest is here. It's for us to work with God to bring it in. God, the harvest, God's presence, these are our givens, these are our realities, and we have confidence that God would do what God says God wants to do. The first priority of the Methodist Church is what? What do you think it is? It's a question I've asked over about the last 20 years of my ministry since we first had the priorities. And very, very few people seem to know what our first priority is, but it's a beautiful one, it's a fabulous one, it's a powerful one. The first priority of the Methodist Church is to have confidence in God. The writer of Hebrews was absolutely right. Without confidence, what are we? But we have confidence because God raised Jesus from the dead, and gifted the power of the Holy Spirit to us and through us and for us to transform the whole world. And our experience is one of a confident people. And the God who calls us into partnership is the God who empowers us to do what he calls us to do. And as we look around this harvest field, and as I look at this straw, this is what God intends for the church to be like, a harvest church, a church that sees the harvest of God's love and God's justice transforming life for everyone in ways that are real, substantial, tangible, beautiful, meaningful, and full of love and hope. So, as holy partners, Let's have confidence in the God who calls us by name. Let's have confidence in the God who meets us face to face in Jesus. And let's have confidence in the God whose Holy Spirit brings signs and wonders and miracles in our midst and whose gifts bring us alive. Now that is quite some vocation. But then this is quite some circuit. And it's been a huge privilege to serve here over this last two years. Two years that I didn't expect, two years that were a surprise, uh, and two years which have been a delight. It's been a real privilege to serve you. A huge honour to be a minister in this North Yorkshire coast circuit. And as a circuit that takes your holy partnership seriously, as a circuit that has confidence in God, I'm convinced that there is a huge harvest waiting for you.
God bless. And thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, join me in our prayers for today, which include strategic prayers for mission, our pastor for evangelism and discipleship, and faithfulness as a fruit of the Spirit. Thank you, David, for teaching us from Hebrews this morning, and we will enjoy chewing on it in the coming week, and we are really going to miss your teaching, David. Let us begin by thanking God for David. Lord, we have been so blessed by David's ministry and his friendship to us here at Burniston. Our understanding of your word has been greatly enriched these past few years. We've been well fed and inspired, and so we are sad that this chapter is over. But we rejoice with David and Sue, for what you have in store for your faithful servants is exciting and good. Lord, we pray for a joyful and problem-free Thanksgiving service this afternoon, and also for good weather. We ask for a special double portion of your blessing on this day, thanking you for everyone who has worked tirelessly to make this first church reunion happen. We want to send David and Sue off with joyful appreciation and thanks, so we are asking that this afternoon's gathering would all go smoothly. How lovely it is that Brian and Sue's family have so generously provided their field for us. Father, would you bless them all with your good gifts? Dear Heavenly Father, we have so many questions to ask you because during this time of lockdown, it feels like we, your church, are in exile. It feels like a wilderness experience. We have the hope that restrictions are being eased, but we know there is a long way to go. As we wait, please soften our hearts to hear what you are calling us to do and to do it joyfully and obediently. As your disciples reveal to us your priorities, not ours. We want to get up close to you so we can really listen to your instructions. Holy Spirit, help us to read Jesus' letters to the churches in Revelation 1-3 to with new eyes. In these times, let us not be the ones who miss the whole point you are making. We need to repent, we need to pray, and we need to be led by the Spirit of the living God. So, Lord, change us, renew us, so that we are ready and eager as your bride. These are exciting times although scary as well. The church is at a pivotal point. Lord, we recall Queen Esther, who for times such as these was in a position to save the Jewish people from annihilation. Esther was Jewish herself, and you gave her courage, Lord, to risk her life to save your people. Father, wherever you place us, enable us to be brave and speak out for truth and justice. May your faithfulness shine out through us so that it witnesses to all we reach that they may be saved. With the help of our future pastor of evangelism and discipleship, show us, Lord, workable, practical ways to reach out to the lost, poor and needy in our community. Although we are very restricted by the pandemic, help us to use this time to pray consult and prepare for a busy mission field. For this is your desire, Lord, to establish your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Lord, as your disciples in your mission field, we take the name of Christ with us, where we work, where we live, and where we are educated. And we take the name of Christ with us to places of leisure and fun, or where we find hopelessness and pain. Let us be the hands and feet of Christ, and in the name of Christ, bring your comfort, your good news, releasing captives in our community. Let us pause for a moment to think of where God may be sending us, and those individuals he wants us to reach in the name of Christ.
Father, we pray that you would reveal the way forward for Burniston Church. Do you want us to do church differently? And what would this look like? Open our eyes to find ways to connect with those on the fringe of church and our wider community. We do thank you for raising up those of us who are already making meals for those shielding, assisting refugees with clothes, keeping people company by phoning them regularly, or social distancing in homes and gardens. Thank you for the diligence of folk who post out or deliver gifts of cards and flowers, and much, much more. There is much to celebrate in all the good, kind acts that your church is involved in, Lord. Ignite a passion in us all, so that mission is not done by the few, but that we are all your missionaries. As the writer to the Hebrews says, we are to consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. So help us, Lord, to be faithfully supporting each other with all our different gifts and fruits of your Holy Spirit. Father, your son Jesus told us in Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Lord, this is an exciting royal commission. Will you help us, Lord, with the practical outworkings of mission during this pandemic? We know that you can make a way where there seems to be no way. Lord, we want to name all our mission fields now asking your covering and blessing over all the people involved, including Coffee Stop, Toddler's Bubbles, Boys Brigade, Craft Jewellery and Games Groups, Bus Stop, Rock Club, South Africa Rebuild, Support for Refugees, Fizz, Sidewalk, Rainbow Centre, Past for a Discipleship and Evangelism, as well as all our own mission fields in family, work and everyday life. Lord, your church in Antioch began telling Greeks the good news about the Lord Jesus. In Acts 11 verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So, Father, help us to be inspired to do mission wherever we happen to be. Help us to stand firm in our faith and to be brave in the face of an uphill struggle. And when our new pastor for a discipleship and evangelism arrives, let us all be teachable and willing to stand shoulder to shoulder as your true witnesses. May we too, as your church in Burniston, see a great many people believing the good news and being saved. We need to be ready for that, Lord. So show us, Father God, how to be missionaries during these times. You can remove any barriers and make a way where there seems to be no way. Amen. Now I would like to read William Barclay's intercession for those in trouble. So let's be thinking of particular situations and folk that we know and love. Behold before God. Those for whom life is very difficult, those who have difficult decisions to make and who honestly don't know what is the right thing to do. Behold before God those who have difficult tasks to do and to face and to fear they may fail in them. We hold before God those who know that they can be their own worst enemies. We hold before God those who have difficult people to work with those who have to suffer unjust treatment, unfair criticism and unappreciated work. We hold before God those who are grieving because someone they loved has died. Lord, we hold before you those worried about this week's exam results, job applications, postponed operations and house moves. And we hold before you any who are disappointed in something for which they hoped very much. In Jesus' name. Amen. Loving God, we pray 
that scientists would find a sure, fast and effective vaccine against this virus very soon. We pray your protection over the administering and cost of the vaccine, that fair access would be ensured across the world. Gracious God, we pray for those who live and work in Beirut, draw near to comfort the bereaved and injured. We ask that you would multiply the help and resources needed to rebuild Beirut. We give thanks for all the rescue services and hospital staff and volunteers. In the middle of all the horror, we pray for your peace, truth and justice. Bring courage and hope to the people of Beirut. In Jesus' name. Amen. And back home, Lord, we pray for all who have lost loved ones to coronavirus, all those who have lost jobs or fear losing them. May you position them surrounded by the right support, giving hope. And finally, your word in Habakkuk 3, 17, 19, reminds us all to stand firm with faithful hearts. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Saviour. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. And all God's people say, Amen.